Uh, so we'll we'll kick it off. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Field Crops Virtual Breakfast. I'm uh, Paul Gross, an Extension Educator in Central Michigan, and I'm going to be hosting uh, this morning. We actually have a very good menu today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, farm stress, and of course, everybody anticipates uh, Jeff's weather. So with that, uh, I'd like to go through a few details that we would like to to point out before we get started to please mute yourself during the presentation so there's no distractions. Uh, when you sign in, uh, please sign in with your first and last name. Uh, to do that, you click on the participant list, find your name and hover over top of it, then click more, then rename yourself. Uh, so we can identify, especially if we're doing the for the, for the credits. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd like you to ask them in the chat box uh, at the bottom of the screen. Our UP credits and CCA codes will be given at 7.30 after both of the presentations. Uh, we'd also like to point out that MSU extension programs are open to all. Uh, the collection of demographic data from our program participants is an important and mandated uh, aspect of all of uh, Michigan State University extension programming. This is, this is voluntary and the information will provide uh, uh, not be used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as a member of a group uh, that participated in our program. Uh, a link has, is going to be shared in the chat and we ask and we'd really appreciate it if you fill out that information and thank you for doing that. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, with the weather, with the prices, with everything. Uh, farming is a stressful business and I'd like to welcome Eric Karbowski, our farm uh, stress specialist. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, welcome and good morning. Well, hi, Paul. Good morning. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. I know that uh, stress oftentimes is not a, a comfortable thing to talk about, uh, but we all have it. We all experience it. Uh, and hopefully after we talk, uh, discuss a little bit more about some tools and resources today that uh, people will just have uh, at least know where they can turn, uh, maybe hopefully know a little bit better, uh, create some self-awareness and some tools and resources that are out there. Uh, as Paul shared earlier, my name is Eric Karbowski, behavioral health educator uh, with MSU Extension that focuses on farm stress. And so, um, as we all know, uh, ag agriculture is a stressful occupation. There are a number of different uncontrollable risk factors that are involved in, in farming. And anybody knows that, you know, that farms or is connected with the farming industry, that um, there are a lot of ups and downs. And, and that can happen in the day and seemingly by the minute. Um, and as we think about some of those uncontrollable risk factors, um, we were talking a little bit earlier, just the weather is one of those constant concerns. You know, early on this year, we were we were excited in April because a lot of a lot of farmers were getting in the fields early, then followed up in May and we didn't uh, didn't seem like we got a drop of rain. And then now, um, as Phil shared earlier, once the uh, faucets open, they haven't seemed to turn off. And so um, but, you know, constantly juggling this back and forth with the weather can create a lot of different stress. Um, the crop yields. My father-in-law shares uh, shared often when he was farming that every year, you know, you went into the season uh, expecting a bin buster, and then every year you were trying to figure out where you're going to uh, pay the bills from. And so, you know, just kind of that constant concern with that. Um, <clears throat> obviously, whoops, I skipped ahead. Um, livestock illnesses, if you're a dairy farmer or beef farmer, pork, poultry, any of those illnesses directly impact your ability to, to generate and produce a revenue, um, which, you know, could be the difference of putting Cheerios on the table for your, for your family. Um, and so we know the importance of that. Oftentimes farmers carry large, large debt loads. Um, we know that there are changes in government compliance and making sure that you are in compliance with them. Uh, equipment breakdowns are a constant concern. Um, you know, Paul shared one time with me that one bolt could put you out for, for two or three days and, you know, how important that is. And we know in farming that you have these short windows. Also, uh, family member disagreements, a lot of stress with uh, families and organization or, or groups that I'm working with um, could be like multi-generation farms where people are kind of trying to figure out where their path is, what they want, what that looks like. Um, and, you know, is their future going to be in farming or are we going to continue to have some of these struggles along the way? And so these are all some of the uncontrollable risk factors that are involved in farming. And so when I work with farmers, I always encourage farmers to create some level of self-awareness. Um, oftentimes, and myself included, you take a lot of pride in being independent. You take a lot of pride in being able to, to take care of yourself, but know that it's okay that everybody experiences stress. And 
I think the best way to, I think, get engaged with that is to do, create some self-awareness. How do you know that you're feeling stress? What are some of your physical signs or emotional signs of, of stress? <clears throat> and what does stress look like to you? What does stress sound like to you? If, if someone that knows you well were to ask you how you respond to stress, what does that look like? I know personally that I'm a stress eater. And even though I've worked in the mental health field for almost 20 years now, um, sometimes it takes my wife to say, Eric, have you recognized this, this, or this? Um, before I say, oh, okay, the light bulb goes off and say, you know what, I am stressed. Now here are some of those things that I'm going to take control of in my life so that um, I can get back um, <clears throat> kind of back to that baseline. And so just take a second and ask yourself some of those questions. What does it look like? What does it sound like? Um, maybe ask somebody because we all experience stress and we all respond to it a little bit differently. Um, some of the different signs of stress um, on the body might include headaches, might include stomach aches. Uh, we'll oftentimes see an increase in blood pressure or blood sugar. You may feel like your heart's race, racing or nauseous. In your mind, oftentimes people will feel anxious. We may see them feel angry, sad, bitter, depressed, or hopeless. And then oftentimes the actions for people that are experiencing stress, they either can't sleep, um, they're in bed tossing and turning, can't, can't shut the wheels off at night, or maybe they're sleeping too much. Um, they may not eat, or as I shared, one of the things I struggle with is overeating oftentimes when I, when I experience stress. Um, other things that we'll often see are increased use in substances, and that might be nicotine products, it could be drugs, it could be alcohol. We may see people break things, act out, yell or scream, or it could be the opposite. When they start feeling stressed, they start to push themselves away and isolate themselves from others. And so as you think about some of these signs of stress and you create some level of self-awareness, know that there are some tools out there that might be able to help you. Um, and this is not a one size fits all. And given our short window this morning, I won't be able to go into a lot of detail, but um, the eight dimensions of wellness could be an opportunity for you to add a tool to your toolbox. And I always share with people, um, if it works for you, stick with that one. If you don't think it's going to work for you, it likely won't. But from this eight dimensions of wellness, it talks about physical, uh, which could be any form of exercise, uh, getting outside, <clears throat> maybe going for a walk, intellectual, it could be, you know, reading a book, it could be doodling, it could be Sudoku, anything like that that can kind of pull your mind away from stress. Financial, oftentimes this is an overarching umbrella with a lot of the farms and farmers that I work with and speak with, um, but there are also oftentimes underlying means. And so financial, what does your plan look like? Do you have a backup plan? <clears throat> what is your financial status? And getting help and getting some of those organized can really be beneficial in decreasing those um, stressful times. Uh, environmental, spending some time out in nature or green spaces can be very, um, I think, rejuvenating, re-energizing for people that are experiencing stress. Spiritual, um, connecting with the world around you. Um, if you aren't a religious person, this could be a, a, a form of meditation could also do that, and that could be a stress reliever. Social, staying connected with your peers, engaging, staying connected with your groups. If you have your coffee groups, Make sure you stay engaged with them. And if somebody starts drifting away from that, give them a call and bring them back in because those are very important in terms of staying engaged. One farmer shared with me that that's the best dollar they spend every day uh, is their investment in coffee because it's an opportunity for them to vent. <clears throat> it's an opportunity for them to problem solve, troubleshoot, and they leave there re-energized every morning. Um, occupational, um, and this is a difficult one for farmers, but giving yourself that opportunity to separate yourself from, from the farm, um, how, whatever that is, however that may look like, give yourself that time to get re-energized, get rejuvenated. Uh, and then emotional, um, just making sure that um, you're, you're finding a good balance, that your that you're, uh, things are in check, that you're not letting yourself get overly stressed. So that was a 50,000 foot overview snapshot of the eight dimensions of wellness. But hopefully, uh, if there are things in there, you can reach out to me, you can look into those a little bit more. But those might be a couple of tools that if you are experiencing some of those stresses that you could incorporate into your life. And <clears throat> as I kind of sit around the corner, um, you know, not everybody is able to handle their stress on themselves. And I think the more we break down the stigmas of stress, mental illness, and things like that, um, the more 
open people are to accessing supports. And I'm very proud of the Michigan farmers because uh, we piloted this program last April and we've had a number, uh, a large number of people go through this opportunity and it's a teletherapy pilot project. So within this, um, farmers are able to access um, counseling supports via online counseling. And we have a number of different supports. There's a, there's a lot of information if you go to the Farm Stress website, but if you or someone you know is struggling, uh, I'd encourage you to access this information. I'm the acting conduit, so you can reach out to me uh, and I can share more about the program with you. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of different resources um, if there are concerns about stress um, and often, or, or, or if people are considering um, taking their life by suicide, but there is a crisis text line that's 741741 go the Iowa Concern Hotline, there are a number of different, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and that is 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. Um, there's also the Veterans Crisis Line, or you can reach out to us, a number of it, that information is available on the MSU Extension Farm Stress website. And then finally, I just wanted to share um, a really awesome opportunity that I think a number of farmers across the state have been engaging with. It's the MDARD, France and Legacy of the Land Grant. Um, and through that, it's an opportunity to help support you and your farm uh, either get or stay on a successful track and to navigate some of these different nuances. And some of the key offerings of this are farm financial analysis, business management strategies, the teletherapy program, as I shared earlier, um, but failed to share uh, that as part of this opportunity, farmers can actually access that program if they don't have behavioral health um, coverage on their insurance plan or have high deductibles. Um, this grant is offsetting most, if not all, of the associated costs. So we wanted to make sure to remove that barrier um, while funds are available. We've also created a number of farm stress resources and are providing four different mental health first aid trainings. And for more information about that, you can go to extension.msu.edu farm stress or extension.msu.edu farm management. And with that, do we have any questions at all? Thank you, Eric. Uh the questions will come into the chat, and, and I think uh, if you'd look in the chat, Phil put a, a comment about if you would put the uh, those links in the chat for some of the resources that you outlined. Uh, I would like to quickly ask a question that text uh, go 7417 or more. Where does that take you to? So that is a similar to like the suicide prevention lifeline where if you were to call in um people can actually just text in and it's the same it's a similar platform it's a person that has experience in, in dealing with crisis situations uh and so they can correspond via text because some people are more comfortable with that okay thank you uh let's uh appreciate the information and, and i'd invite the folks to look in the chat box for those resources i do have one for jeff do, jeff uh we had a hurricane coming up i think elsa along the east coast is that going to impact our weather at all that's a and well the, the short answer is no uh, fortunately if but if you're on the east coast it's going to be a pretty big deal it already has been a big deal it it, uh, it was briefly a hurricane uh, at one point here on on wednesday and it made landfall as a strong tropical storm but it's moving right up the eastern seaboard and the main impacts it's it's actually keeping quite a bit of its its circulation and strength together more so than you typically see, but it's primarily uh, heavy rain, wind, and disruption of flights, et cetera. And of course, it's it's moving along one of the most populated parts of, uh, of the U.S. But for us, uh, because of that upper air jet stream currents, uh, it's moving north and northeast. It'll be off into the Atlantic here in a couple of days and, and, and won't won't impact us. So that's and that's typically what happens with storms that make landfall in that part of the the southeast uh, in this case it was the uh, northern florida okay very good jeff thank you uh any other questions uh in the chat box if not uh we have a a, a couple of specialists on uh, uh chris defonzo's on chris is there any uh insect updates that you'd like to share yeah a huge mosquito emergence <laughs> 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 on monday so if you're heading guys are heading to the field make sure you throw that can of uh I almost said raid. Let's not do that <laughs> off or whatever you want to use, man. It's a, it's going to be a bad one. I, I think a lot of those eggs just kind of sat there and didn't hatch. Like, you know, there was, there was no water and suddenly there was water and I, I live in kind of a, a woods and man, I got to plot my escape out of my car now. It's a, it's a, it's pretty bad. Um, I visited a field up in the thumb 
was it? Yes, two days ago. And actually had sooty mold on it from aphids. It was one of these, I think, early planted April sort of fields. And it caught that flight um, flight of aphids out of you know, probably from the from the western um, area where all of the buckthorn is. And uh, it it had been sprayed, but but it had a ton of biocontrol in it too. So I think most of those fields, uh, the, the fields that I was following at Saginaw Valley were not, were, were never sprayed. And it's like miraculous how clean that they are, relatively speaking, between getting some rain on them, getting some water, reducing that stress, and then getting that, that biological control. Um, what else? My, my Asiatic garden beetle trapping that I'm doing in Southern Michigan, those of you like in Southeast Michigan, my adult number numbers went way down in corn. I, I expect they're, they're, they've been moving out into your other crops now, and probably that egg laying is taking place. So that's setting up your next year's infestation. But those of you who may grow vegetables or something, you may see some nibbling on foliage, but they're night active. So sometimes it's hard to tell that it's Asiatic garden beetle that are actually doing it. And uh, we caught our first Western bean cutworms last week. So I'll be checking traps today. And uh, so we're right at the beginning of, of that flight. So thinking another maybe three weeks or so, you might be thinking about getting out there to scout your corn for Western bean cutworm egg, egg masses. Okay, that's what I got. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Phil puts in the chat box that he's starting to catch some Western bean cutworm moths, one to four. Eric yeah. in South Eric's got a bunch, he said. So, yep. So I'll go, I'll go check today. And again, all that data, I hope everybody's putting their data up for free at that Great Lakes site. And that's a good, uh, what do you want to call it? Conglomeration of data together. So. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, uh, Marty, uh, with this wet weather, what, uh, what do we need to be concerned about? Yeah, so um, in soybeans, um, the white mold risk on the sporecaster model is still sort of moderate. Um, where we're irrigated, it's high, but in dry land areas, it's, it's moderate. But, you know, I'd, I'd certainly base any decisions on field history. Um, and then aside from that, you know, there's a lot of flooding damage, obviously, in the soybeans. But coupled with that, there are certainly a lot of Phytophthora uh, pictures and samples coming into the diagnostic clinic now um, and some soybean sudden death syndrome as well uh, that would have been you know, brought on by those heavy rains. Um, and there may be other root rot issues too, like Fusarium and Rhizoctonia. Um, in corn, I think the biggest thing is really tar spot at this point. Um, and certainly don't forget to be looking for a northern leaf blight and grey leaf spot. But tar spots popped up in about five or six counties now, now that we've confirmed. And it's not just the west side of the state as it sort of has been previously, at least, you know, when we had that bad epidemic in 2018. Um, it's in, you know, Montcalm, Allegan, St. Joe, Lenawee, and a couple of others. So um, I just want people to be really ready for that one. The fungicide application at that R1, R2 timing is probably pretty helpful. Uh, for management if if you have it and you have a susceptible hybrid uh, and then from there right there on out it really depends on how the weather plays out right if we get this sort of continued moisture we're going to have some issues uh, and certainly if that continues you know there may have been instances where a second fungicide application might be warranted in mid to late august so that's what i've got okay thanks uh phil has a, a question should producers uh, with a history of white mold try to spray now, or is there a different window for application? Yeah, so depending on where we're at, right, in terms of growth stage, I know our soybeans at Montcalm haven't quite hit R1 yet, but I know our soybeans down in Decatur, probably a good R2, um, you know, probably pushing R3 later this week, maybe next week. So we've got to make sure we're in that R1 to R3 window. If we didn't know anything going into the season, I'd say split the difference and do R2 to so sort of maximize uh, performance of fungicides. Um, but we really want to be within that window. Once you go beyond that R3, which is you know a pod initiating on one of the top four nodes, then the efficacy starts to drop off considerably. So as long as you're in that within that flowering window, you should still get pretty good control if you use the you know a, a good fungicide for white mold. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Marty, for yeah. The, for the information. Uh, uh, Mike Staten's on uh, soybeans. Mike, do uh, you have any comments on soybeans? I'd kind of like to maybe follow up because uh, 
Marty suggested sending samples in for some of those disease problems. Is the checkoff going to be funding any of those, or is that something that uh, what what do growers need to know? That's a really good question. I can I can check into that and see uh, for the nematodes program. Of course, we've always funded that and continue to fund that for sampling for SCN. But uh, I think. I can certainly submit a couple of samples and, and look at some things. Um, I have seen some of the fields that Marty is talking about where we see a combination of flood damage, which is just purely just lack of oxygen, just, just flood damage. And then also maybe the onset of some root diseases. And we'll be visiting some more fields there and with Phytophthora being the number one. I've also had a call about uh, nodulation being um, impeded by the flooded conditions where the plants weren't killed outright, but yet the nodules were dead and turned to mush. So the question there is supplemental nitrogen warranted or will the plants re-nodulate? And that's a really good question. I think if a producer or, or a, a consultant has a question on that topic, I would encourage them to please call me directly and, uh, um, and we can talk about it. It's kind of a complex decision and kind of a site by site decision. Uh, high price of nitrogen and uh, doesn't certainly favor supplemental nitrogen. Also, it's not very consistent across the field, so it makes it hard to apply nitrogen in a spot treatment type of thing. Um, so uh, it, 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 it's a complex question. So um, we'll look into it further, but I do encourage folks to um, call me directly. Cell phone's really easy. It's just 269-355-3376. 355-3376, if you've got nodulation questions. Well, thank, thank you, Mike. Mike. Thanks for the information. Uh, Chris puts in the chat box that uh, she's going to be at the weed tour, so if there's any samples, I, uh, insect ID samples that you need, she'll be happy to look at them. Uh, so bring them, bring them if you're going to the weed tour. Uh, if there's no other questions or comments, uh, I, I guess we're going to bring this to a, a close, but I first, uh, not to put her on the spot, but uh, uh, this week, Samantha Daniels uh, starts officially. She joined us last week, and uh, she's our new educator in Montcalm County. Uh, we're really happy to have her, and I don't know if she wants to to unmute herself and, and say hello, and or if not, that's fair, too. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Paul, for the, the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here, excited to learn about, you know, just everything going on in Montcalm and all the other counties. Thank you, Samantha. Samantha, uh, is, her background is in etymology, so her and Chris are our best, best pals already. So uh, feel free to reach out to Samantha if you're in uh, the Central Michigan area or Montcalm. So with that, uh, I, unless there's any other questions or comments from anyone, I appreciate everybody joining us this morning. Uh, reach out to the, to the specialists that presented this morning if you have any questions. And with that, uh, have a good rest of the day and a good rest of the week.